Hi guys, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Lillian, and on this YouTube channel, I just chit chat about the books that I've been reading. I read a lot of contemporary fiction, novels, memoirs. I also like sci-fi, and because I'm based here in Singapore, I try to read one book about Singapore every month. So this video is going to be about the books that I read in the month of August. So if you want to hear what I read, there are a couple of good ones. Stick around and watch the video. The first book that I'm going to be talking about is called Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zahner. This came out this year and Michelle Zahner is actually pretty well known as a musical act. She is a performing artist under the name um, Japanese Breakfast and she kind of plays like I guess indie pop um, and this memoir is about her relationship with her mother. Michelle's mother is Korean and her father is Caucasian American and she talks about the journey that she went through when her mom was diagnosed with cancer and eventually her mom passing away and a lot of the reflections of their difficult yet very special relationship. The first thing that I'll say about this book, obviously it's pretty sad and emotional because it's mostly about the period where Michelle's mother is battling with cancer and slipping away. But besides that kind of overtone, the main thing that I felt while reading this was very hungry because she has so many very vivid descriptions of Korean food. And that's kind of one of the key themes that Michelle reflects on is the importance of Korean food and the foods that she ate while visiting Korea and also trying to replicate some of these recipes so that she could feed her mother while she was sick. Um, to both her identity and her connection to her culture, but also this being a very important component of her relationship with her mother. And you'll hear a lot of really um, evocative passages that just made my mouth drool. So for example, she's describing the scene where she and her mother um, would wake up in the middle of the night and then go to the refrigerator to snack on something. Um, we'd open every Tupperware container full of homemade banchan and snack together in the blue dark of the humid kitchen. Sweet braised black soybeans, crisp yellow sprouts with scallion and sesame oil, and tart juicy cucumber kimchi were shoveled into our mouths behind spoonfuls of warm lavender kongbap straight from the open rice cooker. We'd giggle and shush each other as we ate ganjung gejung with our fingers, sucking salty rich custardy raw crab from its shell prodding the meat from its crevices with our tongues, licking our soy sauce stained fingers. Between chews of a wilted perilla leaf, my mother would say, this is how I know you're a true Korean. I think as um, someone who's also mixed race Asian, sometimes you do kind of wonder, do I belong to this culture? Especially for someone like me, I don't really visually present as very Asian. I think Michelle looks a lot more Asian than I do but I could still resonate and relate to kind of the uncertainty that sometimes she feels around her belonging. And you can tell that her love of Korean food is one of the ways that she really feels rooted in her Korean identity and feels like she does belong and does say, does feel like she can say I'm Korean. And on top of that, it really is something that roots her in her relationship with her mother. Something else that she talks about that I kind of related to or I found interesting is this idea of Michelle's identity or who she is in society not making sense until she stands next to her mother. And she also describes this experience of being in Korea and being told, oh, you're so pretty because you have a small face. And I do think in China as well, uh, mixed individuals are really viewed as like especially attractive and that's kind of something that's pervasive in Asian society and she describes how in Seoul most Koreans assumed I was Caucasian until my mother stood beside me and they could see the half of her fused to me and I made sense. Suddenly my quote unquote exotic look was something to be celebrated. So Michelle kind of talks about how 
when she was a child growing up in Eugene, Oregon, she always wished she was more white and she didn't like standing out as someone who appeared Asian. And then when she was in Korea, she was kind of praised for her good looks. But in either scenario, she didn't really feel like she was a complete or a whole kind of identity that made sense until she had her mother standing beside her to kind of help people interpret what she is, um, which I think is pretty interesting and also kind of a commentary on the fact that she doesn't seem to think she needs her father to stand next to her to help others interpret who she is because being white or Caucasian is always like the underlying assumed identity. It's like almost foundational, especially in the US. So that part of her is kind of always assumed. And it, the questioning is kind of like, oh, but why do you look a little bit exotic? Or why do you look Asian? And so that's why when her mother is there, that helps things click into place and people can suddenly kind of like figure out what you are or why you look that way. And that really starts to scare Michelle when her mother has passed away and she no longer has kind of like that key to her identity. And she talks about going to a Korean bathhouse and the woman who is giving her the scrub says, oh, you're so pretty, you have a small face. And Michelle says, this was the same word I'd heard when I was young, but now it felt different. For the first time, it occurred to me that what she saw in my face might be fading. I no longer had someone whole to stand beside to make sense of me. I feared whatever contour or color it was that signified that precious half was beginning to wash away, as if without my mother, I no longer had a right to these parts of my face. I would say, all in all, the memoir is really at its heart a memoir. And so Michelle does reflect on race and her identity and her childhood, but the bulk of the driving force of this series of reflections is really around dealing with grief, dealing with something as traumatic as having a loved one go through a very serious health condition, dealing with death, and also trying to navigate the world as a young person. And because of Michelle's identity and her ethnic makeup, those parts of her story come through, but I wouldn't say she's spending an inordinate amount of time really digging into that very deeply, which I really appreciated and think that's kind of the point of having memoirs from diverse perspectives is not to suddenly then have some treatise, treatises of this is what it's like to be XYZ, but instead to just have the authentic stories of pain and grief and living life and have them be told through different lenses and different perspectives. And obviously this particular perspective is one that I relate to a bit more than maybe others. Um, I thought the writing style was really polished, sometimes a little bit overwrought. Um, it didn't always kind of necessarily serve the flow to have like such beautifully polished passages, but I think the writing is really nice and well put together, really well architected, and you can tell Michelle put a lot of thought into kind of her word choice and the language, and I think Overall, the most you can hope for from a memoir is kind of a very authentic sharing of someone's experience, and I really found this to be that. So I will give this a score of 4.6 out of 5. Um, one last thing that I'll comment on is I do think there's something very monumental or weighty about writing a memoir on the relationship with your mother. And in particular, this reminded me of something that Kathy Park Hong said in her book of essays, which is called um, Minor Feelings. And I'm just gonna try to find the quote because I think it's particularly relevant. Oh yeah, so she says, this is Kathy Park Hong from her book of essays. 
To unpack the source of my adolescent unhappiness would be to write about my mother, which I've struggled with in this book. How deep can I dig into myself without talking about my mother? Does an Asian American narrative always have to return to the mother? When I met the poet Hua Nguyen, the first question she asked me was, tell me about your mother. Okay, I said, that's an icebreaker. You have an Asian mother, she said. She has to be interesting. I must defer, at least for now. I'd rather write about my friendship with Asian women first. So Kathy Park Home doesn't even really touch the topic of her mother in that book of essays. And that was really interesting to me because she seemed to be saying, firstly, that's such a raw and deep subject for me to unpack that I feel overwhelmed by the prospect of doing that. And also maybe I don't have the space in this particular book that I'm working on. And then secondly, it also seems to me that she might be saying, is it stereotypical or trite perhaps to have yet another Asian American narrative where the Asian mother is the main kind of force and source of a lot of the protagonist or the author's either childhood trauma or happiness or the impetus for their life and the events that unfold in their life. And I think that's particularly relevant to Michelle's memoir because sometimes I've felt like because the Asian part of me is a little bit more interesting that therefore somehow inherently puts a little bit more focus or attention on my mom because she's the Asian one. And that's similar for Michelle. Like obviously her relationship with her mother is a lot more important to her than it is with her father. And that could be true regardless of race and is particular to her life circumstances. But there's something that resonates against that quote from Kathy Park Hong in the fact that Michelle has like such strong informative experiences with her Asian mother revolving around kind of her mother's Korean outlook, her mother's Korean ideals of beauty, her mother's Korean ideals of success, and also obviously the strong role that Korean food played in her mother in her mother's life and also in Michelle's life. And Michelle talks about going back to Korea in the summers or visiting Korea and her Korean family. You can definitely feel her recounting and absorbing all of these strong memories and experiences from her childhood and her adolescence that have ties to both the role of her mother and her mother's Asian-ness and Korean-ness. And I'm not sure that I'm articulating exactly what I mean here because I don't exactly know what I mean, but I do think that there is something around both what Kathy Park Hong is saying and then the memoir that Michelle has written that speaks to some innate power of having an Asian mother. But I will say Michelle doesn't overdo it and she does spend plenty of time um, reflecting on her relationship with her father and how her father and mother's marriage may have had certain issues. And so I'm very sensitive to the idea of someone kind of using their like Asian mother as like some type of token or like here is like a badge of my racial identity. And I definitely don't think she does that. She gives a very kind of balanced portrayal of her life, obviously through her eyes, that includes both her father and her mother in that depiction. But because this is about the, one of the stronger relationships in her life, which is with her mother, and the fact that her mother has passed away, obviously that takes center stage. The next book I want to talk about is the book that I chose this month that is about Singapore. It's called Homeless. And it's a very slim volume. It's also a memoir, I suppose. Yeah, I guess it's a memoir. It talks about uh, Liana, the author's experience being homeless in Singapore. The subtitle is The Untold Story of a Mother's Struggle in Crazy Rich Singapore. And she 
was really supported by this more independent media called The Online Citizen in Singapore to tell this story. And I think it's probably the first, if not one of the first, descriptions of being homeless in Singapore. I think both the government and other observers would like to say that there are no homeless people in Singapore since the provision of welfare services is extremely high and 90% of citizens live in um, public housing. But when this uh, memoir came out and also I think there was a little bit buzz beforehand on the online citizen and in other media, this really kind of changed that narrative and showed that yes, there are homeless in Singapore. As you can see in this memoir, a lot of these homeless live on the beach. They camp out on the beaches in Singapore. And as you can see from Liana's story, there are several twists and turns in her journey where you can see that the government is unable to provide the services that she would need to get off the beach and into public housing. And so this kind of talks about her experience uh, with her husband uh, camping out in Sembawang Beach and also the various obstacles that she's had to overcome. Not that Liana's individual achievements matter because regardless, we should view humans as humans and take care of them whether or not they're spectacular, you can tell from reading this, Liana is spectacular. So she's quite smart. She is in the express stream, which is kind of the accelerated track, um, which is part of Singapore's education system. But because of her kind of broken home, I guess, circumstances, she is not able to really capitalize on the fact that she's a really brilliant student and she works hard. She's also a survivor of sexual assault and she has various events in her life that really make it difficult for her to both fit into the standard pathway of how to achieve success or financial stability in Singapore but also she's not really able to control her circumstances when it comes to trying to access various forms of government aid. And so both it's an issue of not being aware and not being educated on the sometimes extremely complex ways that the Singapore government provides aid because taking a step back, you'll probably have heard me talk about this on a lot of my other book videos because I've read a lot of political science and more historical accounts of Singapore, but the Singapore government has a very kind of meritocracy based and almost capitalism undergirded view towards the welfare state. And so even though there is the provision of many um, public goods and social services, there's still this deep fear that Singaporeans might become dependent and that they also need to prove that they're working hard and if they have certain you know access say they have like a large flat or they have a car then they're not going to be given as much support from the state and so you can kind of see that throughout Liana's story as well um, she isn't aided by HDB, the Housing Development Board, immediately because she is registered as having a car even though the car has been not been in her use for years. And so little things like that, you can see how the system can be very overwhelming and difficult for someone who's just young and she's also pregnant a couple times throughout this journey and so very vulnerable. And it's also hard for her to get FaceTime with her member of parliament. So she also talks about having to go around Singapore and try to reach out to these various organizations and also wait and meet the people sessions. And she's unable to really get traction with any of these arms of the state who are supposed to help people like her. It's not until a couple of um, folks from the online citizen were doing outreach to these homeless communities and they then wrote in to the minister that she got a response. And then I will say the action was taken very swiftly then and she was moved into a shelter, then she was also moved into a rental flat. But before that 
before her case was escalated in that manner, she had spent years on the waiting list for a rental flat and all of these various mechanisms of social services from the state had failed her to that point. I will say even probably in the last year, this came out in 2019, um, the Singapore government has probably become a lot more sensitive to these failings, but I wouldn't say that they've solved them by any means, and I'm also not an expert in this area at all, but because Singapore is small, um, I do think the government has more ability to kind of put a lot of resources and either at the superficial or at a substantive level to try to address what's at least perceived in the media or through books like this as um, failings of the state to take care of vulnerable populations. I think this is a great read if you want to hear directly from someone who's lived this experience. Um, I would definitely uh, back this up with maybe This is What Inequality Looks Like by Professor Tio Yen or Liberalism Disavowed by Pra Bang Kwat to get a little bit more of an academic take to actually understand what's at play. Another really good book I would recommend if you're trying to understand vulnerable populations in Singapore is they told us to move, um, Dakota Cassia. So that this is talking about moving the entire community from Dakota Crescent, which is one of Singapore's oldest public housing estates into new housing. Those would be some of my top recs if you are interested in learning more about vulnerable populations in Singapore and how the Singapore government approaches the provision of social services to those populations. But I really enjoyed hearing about Liana's story. I think she is super inspiring. She's able to overcome all of these obstacles and become a social entrepreneur and start a few of her own businesses. She gets remarried to um, someone who's very supportive of her and her dreams, and she's able to take care of her children and so I think this is an important story um, just so people understand that Singapore is not perfect and there are vulnerable populations and there are um, failures in the government's ability to care for these people um, but it's on a much 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 smaller scale than I think most other countries um, have but still I don't think that means we should just brush it off and act like um, it doesn't exist. So I will give this a four out of five. It's a very short read. And so I think it is important um, for you to pick up if you're interested in learning more about Singapore. Sorry, the lighting is so dark now. It's about to pour and I could get all my ring lights out, but I figured I would just keep going with the flow and you guys will not mind the lighting too much. I know I'm very dark now, but the last book I wanna talk about is called Act Like a Leader, Think Like a Leader by Hermania Ibarra, who is a professor at INSEAD, which is a really great business school actually based here in Singapore. They have um, two international locations, one in Fontainebleau as well in France. Um, I have several friends who have gone to INSEAD or who have worked there. So it was fun to read a book by a professor and she's really well known and I can tell why. Um, this was a super interesting, this is a much more kind of like not self-help, but a career book. It's a leadership book um, and it's very much written in that sense. She does draw on some of her research as a leadership professor, I guess, or as a management and leadership professional. And she'll talk about case studies and some of her studies, but the tone of the book is really straightforward, really practical. Um, each chapter is summed up at the end. So if you don't have time to read the chapter, I would recommend just reading the summaries at the end. And we actually chose this book for um, Equate's book club this year. Equate is the women's resource group at my company. And I'm one of the co-leads. And so we thought it'd be cool to read this book because our global HR head, uh, loves this book and actually recommended it to us. Professor Ibarra has a lot of great concepts and a lot of great concrete how-to advice in this book when it comes to pivoting, changing your career, transitioning into more management or pivoting into a different industry. She has a lot of helpful advice around how to step up into a bigger role and how to kind of get out of traps that you're stuck in in your career and also more um, specific and tactical advice around networking, um, how to 
think about networking and like how to build out your networks and the strategy around that. Um, but the topic that is central to her book and to her research and that I found most interesting and novel is the concept of outsight. And this is really the key premise of her book. She says a lot of leadership literature and a lot of leadership books always harp on this idea that you have to reflect within yourself, you have to know your own values, that insight is really important to being a leader. And she says, I disagree, I think it's the opposite. What you should do if you're trying to hone your skills as a leader is to just do it. And so she refers to that idea of trying things out, practicing, stepping out of your comfort zone as outside. And she thinks it's really important to draw from outside of yourself, not just networks, but also trying new positions, finding new ways to be playful with yourself, finding new learning resources, and using that as a form of outside to really form and hone your leadership capabilities. So I think I agree with that and that makes a lot of sense and I think you can never really progress or move forward unless you do kind of try things out and experiment sitting around in your room kind of reflecting on like what kind of leader I want to be sounds nice but I agree with Professor Ibarra that probably that's not the best approach for actually becoming a better leader. And now it's raining, I think you can hear the rain, but welcome to the tropics. So it is with Singapore weather. You can see the cat is also very mesmerized by the rain or me, who knows. Um, but yeah, I thought that this was a very interesting book and I think super helpful. Um, I'll give it a 4.2 out of five. And if leadership or a career transition are topics that you're interested in, I think this is a great resource and I highly recommend checking it out. Okay, and as it starts to thunder, I'm gonna wrap this video up. Thanks so much if you made it this far. If you read any of these books, please reach out and let me know what you thought, if you agreed or disagreed. That's kind of my favorite part of making this video. these videos is just hearing from folks that have also read some of the same books. I know Crying in H Mart was a really popular read um, this year and last year, so if you read that, let me know if you agreed or disagreed with what I thought. And if you enjoyed the video, please feel free to hit subscribe. I'll have another video coming out um, next month talking about the books for September. So until then, hope everyone's staying safe and thanks so much for watching.